Welcome back to the HSC Network podcast, everyone. This week, we're joined by Paul Hendry of Jacobs, and we're going to be looking at one million lives and what we're trying to aim, what the aims of it are, and how we're looking to really support mental health into 2021. So, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for the invite, David. No problem. Um, I guess my first question would be, or rather, could you give us a intro into one million lives, maybe the thinking behind it? and why it's such a passionate subject for yourself in terms of mental health? Yeah, absolutely. So look, One Million Lives, is it, it came about actually, you know, in our organisation, we do a lot for mental health, like a lot of other organisations, um, but we felt it was it's still quite reactive. You know, we have a Champions Network, which is phenomenal. We've got like 2,000 plus champions across the globe and um, who are mental health champions in fact all of our executive leadership team our ceo etc have all been trained up as, as mental health champions but we thought there was something um, else that we could do to try and be kind of more proactive with it and try and put mental health in our people's hands their own mental health so we worked with um, a psychologist called peter slocum from perth western australia Peter's a psychologist of, of 25 years and um, a real driver for mental health. Now, she'd done, she was responsible for Australia's biggest check-in, um, which was perhaps, let's just say, the first iteration of, of um, One Million Lives and, and where someone has the ability to check in and check their mental health through the use of an app. So she, she was responsible for the first iteration of that and, and she worked with us um, through that, through that mental health, Australia's largest check-in, and I think, I think over three, three programs or three initiatives, she got like nine thousand check-ins, which was amazing. And um, so we worked with her on that, and the comments that we were getting back from some of our staff were incredible. Um, comments coming back were like, "This check-in has actually saved my life. Um, this is the first time." I have sat down with my partner and talked about my mental health. I have made an appointment to see my doctor based on my check-in recommendations. We were getting comments like that. And then we were also getting um, some data from the check-ins, which was more or less saying that there's a, a high proportion of our staff who perhaps were in the clinical range for, for depression, but it'd been undiagnosed. And that was just based on the answers that they were given through this check-in. So like, we thought it was really powerful and um, we decided to, to work on something which was going to be bigger and bolder. Um, first of all, we thought about you know, doing it across the whole of Jacobs. So Jacobs at that point in time was like a 70,000 70, organisation. And we thought about doing it something across the whole of Jacobs. But then we thought, David, you know, we do a lot of great things in Jacobs. And this is perhaps part of the kind of one of the strands around One Million Lives. We do a lot of great things um, in Jacobs for Jacobs staff, right? But we've got, we've got friends and family who their organisations don't do anything. You know, I could have the mental health champions in my organisation. I could have access to an EAP. But let my, my daughters through their employers or, or students, they were getting nothing. And, you know, um, and we know that we can't rely, without being political, we know that we can't rely in, in governments, we know that mental health funding has been has been cut back, and I think I think at this moment in time, just before the pandemic, um, it was only 2% of um, global health budget was dedicated to mental health, so so we thought, okay, in Jacobs, we, we're, we're good, we do a lot of good stuff, but why wouldn't we extend it, why wouldn't we extend it to the kind of wider Jacobs family? Uh, and then we thought, well, why would we not even be, be bigger and bolder with it and start extending it to our clients, to our contractors, to our peers, to our competitors? And then why would we not even just take it outside the industry? So, so it started kind of snowballing from there. And, and that's where the whole, the whole million lives kind of concept, concept began. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I love what you talk about there, about taking it outside of Jacobs, like, why wouldn't you? It's such a massive issue. You know, we've all, uh, maybe we've not all suffered with mental health, but we certainly all had situations where we may have noticed or 
felt like there was something underlying that maybe now, as you say, I mean, it's fantastic that people have come forward and really said, you know, like, I mean, like you say, that this could is a bit of a game changer for me. This could have saved my life. Um, does it build upon stuff that you looked at previously at Jacobs in terms of mental health? I know you said um, that some of the approaches you felt last uh, before were probably quite reactive, um, maybe didn't get to the root of uh, the issue. Yeah, so, so it actually does. It really complements complements what we're doing. You know, the great thing with our uh, Mental Health Matters programme, as I said, we've got 2,000-odd odd champions. You know, probably one of the key things that that does is, is try and normalise the conversation around mental health, try and eliminate the stigma. Um, and we feel that by sharing our stories across the organisation, whether it's at a meeting, whether it's in a wider forum, Forum, whether it's on a call. I mean, only last week, myself and a couple of the team did a, a One Million Lives Mental Health Resiliency Call. Um, and we got 4,600 people in Jacobs alone dialing in. You know, that's, that equates to about 8% of the business. So you can see how, how important it is. So we, we felt that it really does, One Million Lives really does complement some of the stuff that we had already been doing because what we see the One Million Lives, like check in and platform, um, is it gives us an opportunity to facilitate a conversation. And then we spoke about, you know, the conversations help eliminate the stigma. So it's absolutely complementary. Absolutely. And I mean, in terms of mental health, um, it feeds so importantly into occupational health. Uh, we've got a newsletter going out this week about occupational health and, you know, mental health ties into that so much. Um, do you at Jacobs is the one million lives policy really um, part of the occupational health practice? Do you, are you in a position where you're now incorporating mental health within to that occupational health sphere? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one million lives is still is still in its infancy. We really need to see how it's how it's going to take off. But the 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 early feelings are it's it's going to be with us a long time. Um, it's not going to be that. Um, kind of boom and bust um, program. It's sustainable when it's gathering momentum slowly but surely. So it's not going to drop off a cliff. So, um, But our Mental Health Matters program, absolutely it's embedded in, in how we approach occupational occupational health. And, and it's actually one of the, it was one of the key drivers actually, David, for us in, in, in looking at mental health, um, analysing our accidents and seeing how people's mental state has contributed to to this you know i think the first time i looked at this was maybe six or seven years ago just yeah just before we, we launched mental health matters and, and we looked at a motor vehicle incident that we had and and the person just says look i just ran into the back of them i have no idea why i'm getting married in three weeks i've got everything on my mind so it was kind of from that point i challenged my team to to think about addressing perhaps some of the the kind of mental state of someone when they have an event instead of saying they just put their hands in a line of fire or something so that's something that we are really curious about in the organization now just as a contributing factor yeah absolutely and it, it does make you wonder how many potentially past incidents at all organizations in terms of health and safety how much mental health and a person's state of mind may have played a part in to any unfortunate mishaps well, do you think about maybe perhaps some of the times you've even injured yourself doing DIY at home, right? You know, for me, it's like my mind hasn't been on, on, the, on, on the task, and it could have been because I was worried about something or maybe fatigue, lack of sleep, or something. But it's definitely something that we need to be looking at more closely. Is 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 a an industry, if you like, a sector? Absolutely. We we sorry you mentioned sleep. We covered it um, quite extensively towards the latter half of the 2021 HSC network. Uh, some of the research we found that I think of the thousand participants over half felt that sleep had impacted their performance at work in a negative way. Um, did, do you have any thoughts on that? Is, is sleep an area that you look at at Jacobs alongside the wider mental health sphere? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, I think you'll find when you do the, the one million life check, and it's one of the things that, that we measure as a risk factor, you know, we talk about, you know, how much sleep do you get of a night? And then, part of our resources 
um, on the One Million Lives website is dedicated to is dedicated to sleep. You know, we've done uh, facilitated events dedicated to sleep as well, and it's like, and like like everything else, David. The kind of more you look at it, you know, not being a psychologist or or anything like that, but the more you look at stuff, the more you get educated. You know. Um, some people are naturally a nightingale, some people are lark, you know, some people like to go to bed early, some people like to go to bed late. If the two of you are in a relationship, as an example, that can it can be problematic. And, and this is one of the things, you know, um, that we discuss frequently, actually, is around sleep and getting 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 good sleep. Absolutely. Um, what got you into health and safety? You're, you're clearly passionate about it. The reason I ask is I've sort of only dabbled my toe if you like into the industry since we've set up page you know, with Paul in the past year and from the outside looking in I mean health and safety maybe it comes with a stigma I personally obviously had my own maybe miscomprehensions or misconceptions rather about in the past um, but one thing I have noticed in that everyone in the industry seems to be incredibly passionate can you tell us a little bit more about how your story and how you got into it yeah absolutely um my mother and father got me a clipboard for Christmas. I'm only joking, right? I'm only joking. Look, look the reason the reason I got into it was was I was I, I'm a construction manager, right? So I've been in construction since it was actually one week before my 16th birthday. I started construction college. Um, I done construction management, and um, I was running projects in construction, and. I was doing really well. I was building a, a, a decent career for myself. And I was on a project in Scotland, a power station, and um, I was asked to, so this is going back to 1997, right? So I can't believe how far the industries came in, in that time, although, you know, although we've still got a long way to go. You know, we're talking about mental health, but back then, you know, there's bits of, bits of asbestos lying on the ground and yeah, stuff like that where I was working, right? So we've came a long way. But, and that's actually the reason I got into it. Um, we were working in this power station and there was a massive asbestos strip going on and we were asked to go into certain areas and, and there was asbestos on the floor. And my guys were come to me and saying, hey, this isn't safe. And absolutely, and I cared for my guys, some of them I'd grew up with in the industry. And so I decided to kind of take ownership of it and I attended meetings on it. and. Basically, the head of safety for the power company said to me, hey, you're really passionate about this. And who wouldn't be passionate about, um, you know, not, not keeping people safe, right? So, so of course I am. And then he advised me to go and do some some courses. And, 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 and I, went, I went back to college and all that kind of stuff, right? And, but not with the intention of having a career because there was a stigma associated with the career actually right you know i mentioned the clipboard i can remember the, the safety safety guys and some of the projects i'd been on it was like when i think back now like it's like toe curling to be honest right put your glasses on tidy up it was that was that was really it where's your gloves that was really it and um and i think back to it now so i had no intention of, of getting into it as a career um, and then I was doing construction, then I'd do a safety role, see what it was like, do construction. So it was like between between 97 and 2001, perhaps I was doing construction, then back into safety, just to see what it was like, right? Um, and I just found myself like really passionate about it, like, like, like genuinely loving it, you know, looking forward to going to work. And, and I'm still like that to, to this day. I could sell this career to anybody because it's, no day is the same. No day is the same. And and if it wasn't for my work, I would I'd have really struggled through this whole lockdown, to be honest. My work has been varied. It's keeping me energized and motivated, you know, helping people and it's just fantastic. Yeah, exactly. And that having something to do, and I know that's something myself and the team talked about. We just felt so lucky to not be on furlough, to have like that reason to get up in the morning and work really hard at what we lose and what we love to do. Um, what would you say to someone who maybe has misconceptions around health and safety uh, to try and give them a bit more of an idea about what the work entails and how it that you help to make a difference? Um, that's a great question. You know, I think I think actually doing doing the job. You know, one of the things I've, I've said to my organisation, and I'm pretty sure a lot of other organisations have done similar, is, is about 
putting some of the high potential um, people, making make them spend some time in safety to understand what safety is really like. You know, in safety, you've got your ear to the ground, right? You know, people tell you things. You can be the conscience of the organisation. This is this, this is like not disregarding all the kind of technical stuff that you need to do around planning and stuff like that, risk management, but you actually become the kind of the conscience of the organisation, the listening ear. Um, so I would just encourage, I would just encourage people if they've got an interest in it to go and spend some time doing it. Go and shadow someone. Come and spend some time with with someone like me or. You know, just go and go and do it. And, and a really good example of this actually is is we hired hired someone for our Australia New Zealand business um, about eighteen months ago. And what we did was we went through the usual, you know, hiring process. And and there was this guy who demonstrated so much passion for our Beyond Zero program. That's our safety program. Um, he was a leader in the business already, so we spoke to him about coming across to to try safety. Say, hey, I've I've not got any qualifications. Like, don't worry about it. You've got all the correct behaviours, attributes. We'll get you the qualifications. You know most of it anyway because he was a director of ops. So we brought Andy McConaughey across into safety to be the head of safety for ANZ, Australia, New Zealand, and and I said to him at the time, Andy, you will look thoroughly enjoy it. Um, your day will be so varied. You'll work hard, you work really hard, right? But you'll really enjoy it. And he actually reminded me of this conversation maybe like just before the turn of the year. He says, do you remember that conversation we had in Dubai? I went, yeah. He says, I totally agree with you. He says, it's the most fantastic career move I've ever made. And this is a guy who's who ran big water projects and ran teams, etc., in Tasmania. Fantastic stuff. And yeah, I think it's great to touch upon maybe health and safety and try and shed a light on what it's really like in the industry. Um, just going back to 1 million lives, where do you see it develop? Obviously, it started in 2020. Where do you see it developing in 2021? And obviously, you mentioned that you want to make it a really sustainable project. Uh, where do you see it going in 2021 and beyond that? Great question. And, and it's it's one I've been asked before. And and. I just think as it grows, the more people will get engaged with it. When we release some of the data, which we're analysing right now, um, some of the data is so powerful. So, as I say, without like misspeaking, I looked at some of the data um, a couple of days ago, and and of those in the eighteen to twenty-five year olds who have who have taken the the check-in, more than fifty percent have had suicidal thoughts. Right, that's that's just powerful data. So mm-hmm. what we're what to do is we're really what to kind of analyze this data and make sure we're we're representing it well, making sure we're getting the right demographics associated with the with the results. So I think, um, David, once we start releasing some of this data into the wider um, environment, if you like, it will then encourage more people and more organisations to undertake the check-in. So I, I just see it growing and growing and, and, and it's becoming a brand in its own right now. People don't say Jacobs, one million lives. People just say one million lives and that's deliberate. We really kind of subtly branded it because we want one million lives to be the brand we want. And we've got some, especially from, from the HSE Global Series Network, we've got a lot of great people like like Malcolm Stays from Laurier. I mean, I, I don't want to go through a bunch of people in case I miss some people out, but there's a bunch of people in this global series who are really passionate about taking this, taking this wider and, and as, as far as we can go with it. But the power of it will be when we get much more data, because then we can like release this data and it may inform policy of a, of a region, of an administration or something as we move forward. Perfect. Well, Paul, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, everything you're doing with 1 million lives. It's certainly something that I know Paul uh, will want, want me to say is something we want to support with a network and global series going forward into 21 and beyond, as you say, once you've got all that data to really help drive difference. Um, I guess the last question roundup is, uh, is there anything you want to say? How can people find out more about 1 million lives if companies want to get involved? We've got our own website, which is um, www.oml.world. 
and um, you get all your information there, how to do a check-in. There's, a, there's an FAQ there as well. A lot of people obviously concerned about data collection, but we've got the high security and privacy policy that we could we could implement. We don't ask for personal details or anything like that. So look, for, for me, there's, there's probably three strands to this. Doing the check-in is taking men, your own mental health in your own hands, right? And then, then it's about taking it out to others to get them to do that and then eliminate the stigma. And then it's about us as a group coming together to use that data. All of us, I keep saying this, a lot of organizations are doing a lot of great stuff. It's time, it's time we all joined hands and locked arms and linked arms and done it together. We'll be much more powerful that way. But look, if I can just tell you a, a quick story um, on this, on When My Own Lives, I had an amazing story told to me yesterday, actually, David, and I spoke about, you know, at the start of the call about people being undiagnosed with like depression, mental illness, and um, but they were kind of in the clinical range based on some of their, that, some of their answers. A, a guy contacted us yesterday, and I'm going to speak to him later, so I don't know the whole story, but effectively, he'd done the One Million Lives check-in. He knew something wasn't right with him. He'd done the One Million Lives check-in. He got his personal report. His personal report and recommendation stated that he actually needs to make needs to consult with his doctor. He's consulted with his doctor, and now he's been diagnosed with depression, right? Which is phenomenal because if he'd be, he'd went undiagnosed, it would get worse and worse. Now he's on a path for treatment, etc. Which I think that's that's just a beautiful story to tell, and it kind of sums up why we wanted to do that because guys in particular don't reach out. No, absolutely, and it it just funny you say that, that that story really resonates, and it just reminds me of uh, we had um, Gareth Mullen from Thames Water on the HSC Network uh, podcast last year. And he was talking us through an occupational health drive that he had, uh, which was just screening for prostate cancer. You know, it's something that a lot of men do neglect and it returned some amazing results. And people were able to get help uh, diagnoses where they may have otherwise not got them. And the fact that we can do something similar, uh, really focusing on the mental health aspects, I just think hats off to you. It's a fantastic, fantastic drive. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the HC Network podcast. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming you back soon. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and, and take care, David. Thank you.